Can we settle? Uh oh, I'm going to start calling names here in a minute. <laughs> you know I know a lot of you. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Claire Guthrie Gastanyaga, and I have the privilege of I introducing our uh, last speaker for the day. And it's exciting for me because this is a woman who makes a business out of politics. And as those of you who are active in the field know, um, there aren't enough of those people, and certainly not enough of those people who are offered the opportunity to do really important things in really important campaigns at levels at the statewide level and, at, and then at the national level. And I get the privilege of introducing one of those people to you, and I'm excited about that. Um, Patty Solis-Doyle, who is our next speaker, is a partner at Utrecht & Phillips, which is a firm specializing in government and public relations. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in communications from Northwestern University. She began her, began her presidential campaign experience as one of the first staffers on Governor Bill Clinton's 1992 presidential campaign. And beginning in 2000, Ms. Solis Doyle took leave from her White House duties and served as Chief of Staff for now Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's 2000 Senate campaign. From 2007 in January through February 2008, Ms. Solis Doyle was the campaign manager of Hillary Clinton for president. And following that, she acted as chief of staff for the vice presidential operations at Obama for America, where she built a national team of policy communications, political and field operatives in advance of the nominee's selection. Now, that is a resume of doing the business of politics. I'd like you to help me welcome Patty Solis Doyle. Thank you so much. I bet you liked hearing the last speaker of the day on a Friday. Um, thank you, Claire, so much for that kind introduction. It really is um, a privilege to be here this afternoon, and, and thank you so much for come hearing me speak. Um, as Claire mentioned, I've been involved in politics for more than 20 years, and I've had the very distinct privilege of being part of some of the most amazing political campaigns of our lifetime. But uh, 2008, in particular, was truly, I think, a momentous year for our country. A sea change in the way we practice politics and who can play in it. And it was an exhilarating time for me personally because I had a front row seat to history. I was working for both the first viable woman candidate and the first successful African American candidate. And I was proud to make a little history of my own as the first Hispanic woman to ever run a presidential campaign. One of the best things about all of these firsts is that it surprised our young people, who some are here today, a lot less than it surprised us. The difference um, raises important questions. What changed in politics and in business for women and minorities over the last 20 years and why? I'd like to help answer these questions by taking a bit, talking a bit about my father and the lessons I learned from Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and the hundreds of committed, talented men and women who helped them get elected. My parents immigrated from Mexico to Chicago in 1954. My father worked in a furniture making factory um, during the day and drove a cab on weekends. At night, he mopped the floors at our parish school and my mother took a, a job in a commercial laundry across the street from our apartment. One summer, my sisters got part-time jobs there, uh, but with the heat and the fumes, they barely lasted three weeks. My mother worked there for 20 years, and she never complained. On weekends, she answered phones at our local community center, and together, the most they ever earned was $18,000 a year. My father instilled in us a very simple creed, as de valed, which means value yourself. Don't ever do anything to embarrass yourself or your family, he would say, and always work hard to do your best. It's still the best advice I've ever gotten. My neighborhood was pretty rough, so my father kept me and my sisters inside after school. And with all his talk about the importance of education and so little else to do, I earned pretty good grades. I won a scholarship to an all-girl Catholic high school across town. I was one of the only Hispanics at the school, and because it took so long to get back and forth across town, I couldn't join any after-school clubs or participate in sports, and my mother and father worked too many jobs to participate in parent activities. It didn't stop me from graduating near the top of my class, but it did pre prevent me from being a true part of it. 
When you're 15, you understand the loneliness of being different, but you cannot totally grasp how much you're missing. I wasn't invited to sleepovers or parties, and I didn't go on dates. My parents never met more than a few of my classmates. For me, school was one world and home was another. Managing those two worlds became harder in college. After graduating high school, I was accepted to Northwestern University. Between some scholarships and some financial aid, I pretty much had a free ride, which was the only way I could attend. Northwestern was only about an hour away from my family's apartment, but in some ways it felt like Mars, only Mars with not only an unparalleled curriculum, but also with a lot of parties and all sorts of kids from places like Greenwich and Beverly Hills. I was embarrassed about where I came from. I was self-conscious about my clothes and my South Side Chicago accent, and I couldn't just grab a bus home every afternoon. There was no way to find the lonely balance I had managed through high school. Something had to give. So, I stopped valuing myself like I should have. I partied too hard. I stopped working hard in class, and I stopped wanting to go home. I lost my scholarship. I married at 19, dropped out the next year, and was divorced at 21. Yeah, I was a bright young woman at one of America's finest universities, but I was wrestling with the same insecurities my father felt every time he tried to speak his immigrant English. You see, my father lived here in the United States for more than 40 years, but he never really learned English because he was just too embarrassed by his heavy accent. Instead, he brought one of his kids as a translator with him wherever he went. He was a patriot, an incredible father, and a brave and strong man. But his approach to America was a lot like my approach to high school. It worked, but it was a lot lonelier than it needed to be. The answer ultimately for my father and for me was hard work. Having lost my scholarship, I enrolled in Northwestern's night school. I had to support myself and pay for college myself. I managed to land a job as a secretary at Northwestern's law school, which helped me pay for my tuition. I worked hard all day and went to classes at night. I studied all weekend and during my lunch hour at work. It was exhausting and humbling and frustrating. When I graduated from Northwestern, my oldest brother, Danny, introduced me to politics. Danny had spent years as a community organizer on Chicago's South Side, alongside a very bright young man named Barack Obama, by the way. <laughs> he began to take me to rallies and to knock on doors and to canvas people. Gradually, I moved from the streets to campaign operations, and that's where I found my place. Some people in politics are motivated by issues. Some are motivated by a particular candidate. I, on the other hand, love the process, the game, and the strategy involved in politics. I knew I had found my calling. A lot of my passion for politics also had to do with the people. I was lucky enough to work for Mayor Richard Daley's mayoral campaign in 1989. I didn't realize it at the time, but my friends on that campaign would later become some of the most talented and celebrated political operatives in the business today. David Axrod and Rahm Emanuel, now household names, helped manage Daly's politics, fundraising, and message. And when Daly won, I followed him to City Hall. A few years later, Daly's former campaign manager was picked to manage then-Governor Bill Clinton's presidential campaign. He offered me a job. And I said, who is Bill Clinton? <laughs> when I got to Little Rock, I assumed, naturally, and I expected to work for the governor. Instead, I was assigned to work for his wife. I was disappointed because I wanted to be where the action was. Boy, <laughs> I was in for quite a surprise and for the ride of my life. For the first three months, I was Hillary Clinton's only staff member. I did her scheduling, her correspondence, I picked up the dry cleaning, and I did just about everything else. That opportunity turned out to be a true gift but it sure didn't come in very fancy packaging. It was hard work, but a magical time. I was the 12th person hired on a long shot campaign that went all the way to the White House. And as I looked at myself, at the energy, the faith, and the talent that I was putting into that race, my father's advice came into new focus. I felt different. I suddenly felt like I belonged. You see, Little Rock was not all that different from my high school or Northwestern. It was one of only a few Hispanics, and there were no Hispanics running the show. But I was different this time. I brought my Latina world with me into that campaign, and I didn't let it go. It's a lesson, I think, that Hillary and Barack Obama have taught thousands of young Americans. Just think of how many pundits have told Hillary or Obama to change. 
Brock has to be more black. Someone will say, Hillary needs to be more feminine. They questioned her hairstyles, her pantsuits. They questioned Obama's incredible self-control. And what did they do? Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton ignored it. In politics, you need to be authentic to win. In life, you need, authentic, you need to be authentic to be happy. During the 1992 campaign, Hillary was often the only woman at the table for the big decisions. She was there not because she was the candidate's spouse, but because she had an innate talent for politics and strategy. While many of the male staffers resented her presence at those strategy meetings, every one of them respected her input. And while we had some women staffers, the real important decisions, the ones that related to message and money and strategy were all made, made by men. James Carville, George Stephanopoulos, Rahm Emanuel, et cetera. So I think Hillary got a little tired of being the only woman at the table back then in 1992. So she asked her friend, Susan Thomases, an accomplished lawyer from New York who had worked on several local New York and New Jersey races to join the campaign. Susan was hired to be the director of scheduling for all of the four principals, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Al Gore, and Tipper Gore. It was a big job. She was to provide vision and guidance to the schedule. It was her job to make sure that every event, every principal did reinforce the campaign's message. I don't know if you remember the Clinton-Gore bus tours back in 1992, but the idea was to have all four principals ride on a big bus through the heartland of America. Everywhere they went, crowds gathered, we monopolized the media wherever we went because there were all four of them and, and there was not much else going on in that market. Those were all her ideas. She did an amazing job. She insisted on being in every meeting. She spoke to the principals, principals directly when she needed to and she made her voice heard. Susan was married when she joined the campaign and she had a two-year-old son. She moved both her husband and son to Little Rock with her. And when she worked 18 hours a day at the campaign headquarters, her husband took care of their son at their small rented apartment near the campaign. Susan was not as celebrated as George Stephanopoulos or Rahm Emanuel or James Carville, but she and Hillary were my mentors. They not only taught me everything I know about presidential politics today, but they also taught me that indeed it was possible to have a career, a marriage, and a family without sacrificing any of it. Susan was tough, smart, and opinionated, and just about every man on that campaign hated her. <laughs> I really couldn't figure it out at the time. I mean, she wasn't any tougher or more opinionated than any of the guys were. I guess they just didn't expect it coming from a woman. When Bill Clinton won, Hillary continued to promote women in the White House. Her staff, nearly all female, stood apart. We got along with one another, we didn't leak to reporters, and we wouldn't take no for an answer. We also watched each other's backs. When I had my first child, Hillary made sure I had a crib in my office in the White House mm -hmm. for days when I needed to bring my baby to work. Hillary attended staff weddings and baby showers. She looked after campaign volunteers long after they left, and she made sure that her senior staff did the same. We made sure younger staffers got promotions or found time to attend law school at night. Um, some of you may remember another example of Hillary's leadership on empowering women. Um, but Hillary and, and the rest of us in the White House on her staff caused a national security controversy in 1995. The UN had decided to hold an unprecedented women's conference in China. Hillary had a clear vision of the speech she wanted to give at the conference, but most of President Clinton's security advisors wanted her to stay home. They argued that Hillary's remarks were too provocative, and at the same time, they were under negotiations for other things with, Chi with the Chinese. I spent months arguing with the president's guys. I remember Hillary, the first lady, telling me that if she had to, she would book her own commercial flight and go as a private citizen. <laughs> In the end, Hillary prevail prevailed. The Chinese government was even more worried than the President Clinton's advisors had been. <laughs> They moved Hillary's speech outside the conference grounds to a field miles out of town. No plumbing, no electricity, and then they refused to provide enough buses for the women who wanted to attend. Our staffers were pushed around, reporters were detoured, camera crews were pushed to the side so that they couldn't get a clear shot. But the women showed up anyway, tens of thousands of them, and Hillary spoke. She was the star of the conference,
and she became a hero to women across the globe. To this day, whatever, wherever Hillary travels, women still press old Xerox copies of that speech into her hand so she could sign it. And what was so provocative about that speech? What frightened all those people, all those men? It was five simple words. Women's rights are human rights. Now, to me, again, this seemed pretty straightforward at the time, but perhaps I was just a visionary. The fact that women's rights are human rights was considered controversial just 14 years ago shows just how far uh, we've come and how much things have changed. And the story of how those words were finally spoken shows what it took to achieve that change. In her presidential campaign, Hillary continued this tradition of breaking down barriers. Women were a part of every decision. She again asked me to run her campaign as I had uh, in 2000 in her 2006 Senate races. Her media advisor was a woman, her policy director was a woman, and so on. Most of us were also minorities, Hispanic, African American, Asian, Indian, Arabic, and the faces around that table in 2008 looked very different from the table in 1992. Hillary's presidential campaign, of course, didn't turn out as we had hoped. <clears throat> but I'm proud of the race we ran. I'm proud she became the first woman in American history to ever win a state's presidential primary. I'm proud that America saw the passion, tenacity, and resilience that I've admired in Hillary for years. I'm proud of her 18 million votes, those 18 million cracks in the glass ceiling. But I also know we made mistakes, and I would do some things differently if I had the chance. One thing I would try to change would be, and this is ironic, would be to get women on board with her earlier. We certainly understood the importance of the women's vote and tried our best to reach out, but for whatever reason, it wasn't until we started losing after we lost Iowa that women truly came on board for Hillary. Women have always been a complicated voting block for Hillary. I saw this most dramatically when Hillary ran for Senate for the first time in 2000. It was an unprecedented campaign. It was the first time in history that a sitting first lady ran for statewide office, or any other office for that matter. And it posed several problems, both logistically and politically. But right off the Monica Lewinsky scandal, our biggest problem was getting the support of New York women. Our focus groups and our polling told us that women really did want to support her, but there were complicated emotions that went into, her, into their calculations. Was Hillary too ambitious? Was Hillary too strong? Some women were uncomfortable with her political success. Some were threatened. Some were unhappy that she stayed with her husband after the Lewinsky affair. Some were proud that she stayed with her man, but they didn't really want to admit it. Like I said, it was complicated. We conquered the issue, or tried to conquer it, by talking to women in smaller settings, you know, uh, in coffees at women's homes, both in the suburbs in New York, where there were maybe more, no more than 15 women at a time. And it was there that Hillary, without any television cameras or any reporters, where she explained her choices in these small intimate groups to these women. And those women would then tell their friends, and those friends would then tell even more friends. And it worked, because women in that small intimate setting found her real, honest, and most importantly, normal. As I said, we had similar issues in Hillary's presidential campaign. We weren't re reaching women as effectively as we should have. When Hillary lost Iowa, it was devastating to our campaign. Many voters, the media, and the other presidential campaigns basically wrote us off. But New Hampshire was the next state. And in New Hampshire, after that loss, she showed a rare glimpse of true emotion in a diner in Nashua when she was asked, how does she get up every day in campaign? And she answered, honestly, that it was hard, and her voice cracked. Well, women came to her defense and honor in droves. In fact, they leapt her, to her defense. It was as if women said, I'm not ready to let the dream of a woman president slip away so easily. The online contributions started pouring in, the polls started ticking up, the mood around the campaign brightened. If we could have tapped into that feeling earlier, it might have been a different race. But by then, Barack Obama's momentum was probably impossible to stop. Hillary's vic victories in New Hampshire and Nevada were not enough, not enough to offset his huge victory in South Carolina. And then we were at the mercy of the uh, calendar with a string of states that favored him. It was at this point that I parted ways with the campaign. 
It was a terrible time for me. I wanted to crawl under my bed and hide. But that wouldn't have been a very good example for my daughter. Most painful was that I couldn't give my side of the story. There was still a primary being fought, and I didn't want to say anything damaging just to clear my name. In that media glare, I felt firsthand some of the same sexist treatment that had dogged the campaign. The double standards and the immature jokes and the focus on Hillary's laugh or her clothes. The one that really angered me was the accusation that I used too much foul language and was too aggressive. Now, do I always have the vocabulary of an altar boy? No, not so much. <laughs> but am I any more foul mouthed or aggressive than, let's say, James Carville or Rahm Emanuel? <laughs> no, not so much. I was just being held to a different standard. But as difficult as that time was, there was a silver lining. The race had come down to Hillary and Barack, and one of them would soon make history. My favorite image of that campaign was the two of them on stage sitting side by side at the first debate when everyone else had dropped out. And you knew that one of them was going to be our candidate and probably the next president of the United States. And one of them was going to make history. Once Obama won the primary, I was 100% behind him. During our time in the White House, Hillary land, as we called ourselves, succeeded by sticking together. But that kind of trust and respect wasn't just limited to the women I had worked with. During my days working for Mary Daly and for President Clinton, I'd work with thousands of talented people and a few extraordinarily talented ones who just happened to now be running the Obama campaign. The worst thing about Democratic primaries is that sometimes you have to run against friends. David Axelrod, Axelrod, President Obama's chief, strateg chief strategist in his campaign at the time, and I go back some 25 years. At the start of this presidential campaign in January of 2000, 2007, Ax and I promised each other that no matter what, we would remain friends after the primary. And we promised each other that no matter who won, we would both work for the eventual nominee. Now, at the time I made that promise, I was sure the nominee would be Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but we were able to keep that promise because the lessons my father had taught me about honesty and valuing myself had helped me work with and earn the respect of President Obama's winning campaign team. In the heat of that epic primary battle, Obama's guys and I managed to get along. So when the battle was over, they went out of their way to make a place for me. The decision to go work for President Obama was still difficult. I worried, I worried about being disloyal to Hillary, about putting my family through another campaign, and about the obstacles of working in Chicago while my family lived in DC. But my husband and I decided that the most important thing was that our kids grow up under a Democratic president, president even if that meant seeing mom a little bit less. And then I decided just to bring the kids to Chicago with me, just as Susan Thomas's did so long ago. I was hired to be the chief of staff to the future vice presidential nominee, whomever that would be. I had to build a staff and design a rollout strategy that could serve any of the possible choices. Imagine five different announcement venues, five different speeches, five different rollouts, each mapped out in great detail and with complete, absolute secrecy. Throughout the campaign, I was privileged to watch Barack Obama at work, and it gives me great hope for his presidency. He was a hands-on leader on the strategy calls every morning and every night, making the tough decisions when tough decisions needed to be made. But he was also able to step away and avoid the micromanaging when he wasn't needed. And that's a pretty rare quality in a candidate. Obama was able to inspire tens of thousands of people to come out in the rain or snow to hear him speak. He raised an unprecedented $700 million, mostly from grassroots donors. He built an email list of supporters and volunteers, 13 million strong. Yet he always kept a level head. He still wanted to make it home for dinner with his family or to take his kids out trick-or-treating. He, he may have been the biggest thing in politics at the time, but politics was not the biggest thing in his life. That, too, is remarkable. The campaign Obama ran was innovative, diverse, inclusive, professional, and tireless, and it was a joy to be a part of. And whenever the days started to seem too long, there was always the spirit of camaraderie to keep you going, as well as the unspoken understanding that we were electing the first African-American president. It was terrific also to finish the 2008 election back in my hometown. My apartment overlooked Chicago's remarkable skyline and lakefront, but the Metgados and churches of my childhood were nearby, too. They no longer felt like separate worlds. 
We are growing up in a country where diversity is expected, and I believe that's partly because people like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama helped make it so. They overcame discrimination in their own careers, and they made sure to nurture diversity in their own operations. Thanks in part to this nurturing, Hillary Land veterans are today landing senior positions in the Obama White House, helping run movie studios, writing books on philanthropy, launching satellite companies, and managing sports franchises and major universities. And for the fairly small team that we were, those are pretty remarkable accomplishments. So while we don't need to be convinced that women have a right to lead, we already know that. We need to remember that we still need to look out for one another because someone somewhere still thinks that women's rights are not human rights because one day one of you may run a presidential campaign and find male reporters still think your vocabulary is news. And because one day your satellite company may fail or your big movie flops or your sports franchise chokes in the finals, you're going to need a friend to help you start over. I know that's the message my own daughter has received from the 2008 election. She has a poster on her wall that says, when women vote, women win. It's right next to about 10 pictures of Selena Gomez. <laughs> she has started devouring biographies about Hillary Clinton and Margaret Thatcher and others. And she's announced to anyone who will listen to her that she intends to be the first Latina president. As a mother, nothing would make me prouder, but since she's only 13, as an American, I sure hope it doesn't take that long. <laughs> People ask me all the time if we lost our chance at electing the first woman president when Hillary lost that nomination. I always say I hope not. And as is probably very clear by now, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> and I'm supporting Barack Obama for president in 2012. But I have to say this about some of the women in this political cycle. While I may not agree with them on a lot of things, I have a great deal of respect for them. When I was working for Joe Biden on the 2008 campaign, I didn't believe that Sarah Palin was quite ready to be our country's vice president. I didn't think she had the experience or knew enough about world issues to do the job. And I didn't really agree with her on many of the policy and social issues. But, this is a big but, I knew she was a charismatic and talented politician. But what I really admired about her was that she was, an unapolog she was completely unapologetic about being a woman and a mother and a candidate. She brought her children with her on the campaign trail. She made no pretenses about where her priorities laid. She, as a working mother myself, it really spoke to me. Michelle Bachman, who is running for president on the Republican side this time around. Again, I don't agree with her on much, but I love that she is giving it her all and has surprised so many of the pundits on how well-spoken, prepared, and charismatic she is. I believe that the more women who run for public office, the easier it is for more women to run in the future. Hillary paved the road for many future women. Sarah Palin paved her own road, and today Michelle Bachman is paving that way too. It will be a great day when we come to an election cycle, and it will not be considered remarkable or surprising that a woman is running. It will be a great day when a woman is running for public office, and we don't talk about her hair, her dress, or the inflection in her voice. It will be a great day when a woman is running for office, and she doesn't surprise people by how well she does. It will be a great day when we elect the first woman president, and I hope I live to see it. I hope that all of you will stay involved in some way or another in politics, whether it's as a candidate yourselves one day, or as a staffer in campaigns or in government, because there is one thing um, that I've learned in the last 20 years, is that ordinary women really can get together and do extraordinary things. So please stay involved, and I thank you very much.